Welcome friends to another r slash malicious compliance video. Today destruction happens in a store, but first a story from short finger Dizzy, male Karen and property lines. I'm a senior construction superintendent in the DFW area. The project I'm currently on is a 13 acre site, smack in the middle of an extremely affluent area to the north of Dallas. Three weeks ago, a city inspector that we'll call Joe came into the site office and said they received a complaint about a sprinkler slash soaker line being damaged during excavation for the fire lane. He, my landscaper, and myself went to investigate, discovered where a small fitting had been blown out of the line. Landscaper repaired it, I went up to knock on the door to explain to them the issue and inform them of the repair. I got no answer at the door, so I left a card and a note asking them to call me. They never did. A week later, Joe comes in and mentions that they've reached out again about the noise from the equipment, which is odd because anyone with heavy equipment is currently working on the other end of the property. I again went to speak with them, got no answer at the door, and left a card again. Yesterday, in walks Joe to tell me that they're complaining about our construction fence being on their property and killing their grass. The fence is 12 feet from their fence and our specs call for it to be a minimum of 15 feet from the property line. So I pull up our CAD files on the survey plat so I can make sure that we have it placed exact and realize that their wood fence is four feet onto our property. Their house is about 14 inches onto our property. During all of this, I get an email from the city asking me to place the construction fence squarely on our property line. The email is sent to me, the apparent homeowner, Joe, and my project manager. I brought the surveyors back out yesterday to pinpoint our property corners and give us some 10 feet offsets, reference points 10 feet east of the property line for a line of sight to measure from. I knocked on the homeowner's door again and got no answer. Mind you, every time there were cars in the drive. Fast forward to this morning, my fence crew showed up and they began moving the fence onto the property line which takes 31 inches, 2 feet 7 inches of their driveway, and 18 feet of the road where it ends at the property. Was previously a cul-de-sac. The client finally reached out, or more accurately, came to the site office in a huff. I explained the issue, showed him the plat, and he left with some unkind words flowing from him, like diesel exhaust on a steep incline. I put a pause on the fence relocation just to soothe the wound. My project manager called him, I called the city right of way, engineer, and our client. We set up a meeting that just ended. He claimed that our plat was wrong. The engineer and everyone else disagreed. The back and forth went on long enough for the client, who's an extremely laid back and quiet gentleman, to finally speak up and basically say, we're just gonna go ahead and sell you the property you've stolen at current market value plus 10%. In this area, that's not cheap. If that's not acceptable, we'll just have you move your fence, cut out your driveway, and use the east side of your home for advertisement. Or you can back off, let these guys work, and we'll give you lifetime use of the area you currently occupy, so long as there's no more hassling of any kind. The guy asked me if we'd move the fence back out, and I told him no. I agreed to take it off his driveway, but the street and green space belonged to us. We only did what he asked us to do. The engineer who asked me to move it agreed. So there it is, the story again, the fallout, and conclusion. Do you think considering that the survey showed that all of that land that they're living on or using is actually on somebody else's property, that they're being almost too nice by allowing them to even have this lifetime ability to make use of all that land? Or is it just not even worth fighting about this land that already has a house on it and they've been there for who knows how long? Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. Our next story is from Totnax. It has to be someone close to God? No problem. Happened at the retail flooring store that I used to work for back in the early 2000s. It was my turn as reigning employee of the month to pick our next employee of the month. Gift card, nice parking spot, weekday only shifts for the entirety of the next month. The works. Owner's daughter, Maggie, a hardcore evangelical Christian, on the very same day she was promoted to showroom manager, pulls me aside, Kenneth Copeland style, and says, I don't care who you pick, but this person has to be prayerful and have a close relationship with Jesus. She would badger and harass me all month, forcing me to join her in prayer so that the Holy Spirit could guide me in picking the right Crusader of the Lord. Yep, all that hot steaming garbage. 
Her parents were Christian as well, but not of Maggie's ilk. They never enforced their beliefs on anyone, never prayed in front of us, never praised Jesus or God in front of us. Just overall very respectful and aware that the world is diverse. The day to announce my pick comes. I just recently accepted a position elsewhere, unbeknownst to anyone. I've had enough of the holy Kool-Aid, so I decide to be, um, extra compliant with Maggie's directives. On our beginning of the month morning powwow, I chose our very hardworking and deserving warehouse attendant, Abdullah, a prayerful man of Islamic faith. Once everyone went about their morning, Maggie pulls me into her office and asks me why I disobeyed her orders. I explained to her that I was 100% compliant. Abdullah would kneel in prayer, facing Mecca five times every day, regardless of where he was, and that he and Jesus, our Guatemalan carpet installer, were besties and roommates. Maggie hit me with, May the Lord Jesus Christ forgive you for this grave error in judgment, blah blah blah. I walked out of her office while she was in mid-prayer. She never spoke to me, never even made eye contact with me for the rest of my remaining time there. I love the fact that to her and the other few evangelicals of the store, I was the Antichrist. I don't know if it was actually Jesus or Jesus, the Guatemalan carpet installer, but man is that perfect for fitting into OP's plan. I have no issues with anybody being religious, but the real issue I have is when people try to force it down your throat or force it to preside over everything they do when whatever it is is not even religious at all, like picking an employee of the month. In fact, if OP took Maggie's instructions to heart and actually used that as their guide, doesn't that actually kind of cross some discrimination boundaries? You can't pick anybody that doesn't specifically follow my religion. That sure is warm, inclusive, and encouraging. By the way, if you're enjoying these stories, make sure to hit those like and subscribe buttons down below so you never miss any of my daily videos. Our next story is from I'm Not Sharky. Want me to tell you where I am? Fine, I'll tell you where I am. Backstory. I live a nightlife and I work two jobs. My day job usually consists of working in a restaurant from 5pm to 11pm. My second job consists of cleaning a cafe 7 days a week, anytime between 10pm and 6am. I usually tend to go clean around 5am since I open the door for a delivery guy for croissants. If I'm not there, he has to wait an hour for the place to open. Since I do him this favor, he tends to give me one for free. They're so good, almond filled too. On to the main story, my phone since February 8th has been messed up. Ever since I switched carriers, I can only get calls from people on the new service I joined. Tech still works though. I can call out though, that works. And being honest, this has made my life more peaceful since I'm not bothered as much and I enjoy every minute of it. I live with my parents. My parents worry about me where I am when I'm out. I tend to usually not let them know, but then tell them where I am during the day when I get home. From a parental perspective, you'd want to know where your child is since you worry, but come on, I'm 24. It can get annoying at times from my end since I'm constantly being bothered by texts. Where are you? Why aren't you home? From my dad since he can reach me by text but not call. It's very hard for me to get some alone time, and whenever I have the chance, I tend to take it. Some people just don't understand that. So yesterday I came back home a bit later than normal, and my dad and mom gave me a speech and a half lecturing me on why I should tell them where I am. I simply just told them, the past couple of months I go clean at the exact same time, seven days a week around 5 a.m. What's so different today? Do you pay attention to what goes on around you or has it taken you months? The look on my parents' faces wasn't a happy one, let's say, but they just argued saying to let them know where I am. Fine. You want to know where I am? So be it. Cue malicious compliance. From today, before I left the house, while they're sleeping, 4.45 a.m., I barge in their room. I'm going to clean, I said loudly, waking them up, interrupting their precious sleep. Drive 20 minutes, get to location, I call the house, I'm there safe. Finish cleaning 30 minutes later, call the house, I'm done, I'm going to eat. Drive 15 minutes, call house, I've arrived, I'm eating at a restaurant. Anyways, I just finished eating while I'm writing the story for you guys. I'm about to call them and tell them I'm heading home. Might as well ask if they slept well last night. After all, it's going to be 7 days a week, 365 days a year. I might be a jerk for doing this, but hey, it's what you want, so it's what you're going to get. Fallout slash update, 
I came home a few hours later, barged into the room around 8 a.m. I'm home, I said loudly. They were both out cold. I think I woke them up a bit too much. Six times in two hours? Three were house calls, one phone call via cell, and two barges into their room. The next day, a few hours later after my parents woke up, my dad comes up to me and says, You be very careful, young man, interrupting my sleep. I say, You said you wanted to know where I am, so I let you know. What's wrong? Isn't that what you wanted? He says, I can play dirty too, unless you want to be woken up with a bucket of water. Your choice. Let's just say they hopefully got the message. I think the one nice thing you can take away here is it seems like they're caring to a fault. Like, I don't get the sense that it's any kind of negative abusive thing, like they just want to be protective of you and they care that you're safe and whatnot. It's just all about OP spreading their wings and trying to get through to their parents about, well, needing that space. And our final story of the day is from Rabbit Rathian. These products are too hard to carry without dropping and breaking them. Carry them anyway. Destruction ensues. Another malicious compliance tale from my retail job, involving the same abusive bully of a manager, Stacy, who has featured in some of my past stories. This took place nearly 20 years ago, and I'd probably been working at the store for about a year and was in my late teens. I was working in the menswear section at the time, which was opposite the home entertainment and photo lab departments, which were, in turn, at the very back of the store. The store was having some promotion on photo-related stuff, from cameras to picture frames and other accessories, as well as those novelty instant cameras that made cute Polaroid-type pictures. And the store manager wanted to set up a display of photo lab stuff at the front of the store with stock all along the front shelves. Nothing unusual there. Anytime we had a special sale, we usually displayed the relevant products at the front so customers see them as soon as they walked in. For some reason, instead of just letting the photo lab staff do it, which they would have got around to anyway sooner or later, Stacy, my department manager in the clothes section, decided she wanted the clothes section staff to help move the stock up to the front. Keep in mind, she still expected us to get our sections done properly, even though we had to waste like half an hour on this other work. Specifically, she wanted me to move some large combination photo frames. These frames had spaces for about 10 to 15 photos, like those big family collage frames, and were just under a meter wide and probably about 60 to 70 centimeters high. I can't remember how much they cost, but I do remember they were pretty expensive. Since they included fairly bulky, fancy frames and glass, they were quite heavy, in addition to being awkward to carry. So I went to get a trolley so I could load them up and take them all down. Stacy saw what I was doing and told me to stop wasting time with a trolley and just carry them. Okay, fine. I took only two at a time and carried them up to the front, one under each arm. There were about 25 to 30 of these frames, or four shelves worth, that had to be moved, and I knew my scrawny butt wasn't strong enough to carry more than a couple at once. And they were so tall that if I carried them in front of me, I wouldn't have been able to see where I was going. After I came back from moving the second two frames up to the front, Stacy was waiting for me next to the original shelf with the frames. What are you doing? She snarled. It's going to take you ages if you only carry one at a time. You should be able to carry at least, she stops to look at the frames, seven or eight at a time. I try to explain that I wouldn't be able to carry that many as A, it would be too heavy, and B, even if I could lift them all, It would be so awkward and hard to hold that I could almost guarantee I'd drop them before I made it up the front. Stacy wasn't having it, saying even I could do it. I regret to this day that I didn't respond with, okay, do it then, witch. But sadly, I was still young and had not yet grown a spine, and insisted that I should be able to move all the frames up there in three or four trips. By now, a few of my colleagues who were working nearby had stopped to listen. I tried once more to explain that there was a high chance that the frames would get dropped and damaged if I tried carrying them and asked if I could just at least go and get a trolley. And she said, if you don't carry these frames, and she pointed at a shelf full of frames, up to the front right now, you will get counseled. Basically our version of being disciplined, and it'll go on your record. I figured at this point that there were plenty of witnesses to what she'd said and threatened me with in spite of me telling her why it's a bad idea. So I complied. I managed 
just to pick up the last 8 frames on one of the shelves and get them balanced on my arms in front of me. I was basically a human forklift at that point. I couldn't see a darn thing because the frames obscured my vision, but I didn't let that stop me. I waddled down the aisle using the pattern of the flooring to guide me, shouting excuse me excuse me to make sure everyone got the heck out of the way. I made it about a third of the way to the front and then my foot caught on a bit of plastic wrap that had come loose from one of the stock cages sitting in the aisle. I immediately overbalanced and managed to stop myself falling and regain my footing, but this meant that I had to let go of what I was carrying. The photo frames went flying, crashing to the ground so loudly, I reckon everyone in the store heard it. The glass in all 8 frames were shattered so badly that they had to be completely written off and some of the actual frames were bent and deformed as well. Not only that, but some of the frames had hit the corner of another set of shelves on their way down and knocked the fixtures loose, so about 3 or 4 shelves worth of other stock also came tumbling down. From memory it was stuff like pencil sharpeners, erasers, packets of pens and so on i.e. small fiddly stuff that would take ages to put back once the shelves were repaired. I later found out that the store manager had actually asked Stacy to help with the move, not just shifting stock but also setting up displays etc, as well as the other couple of department managers who were on that shift, and that aside from the photo lab and home entertainment staff, all other staff were only meant to do their regular jobs. Stacy had just dragged the closed section staff in because she wanted it done faster and wanted to get out of doing the work herself. Luckily, I didn't get into any trouble. The store manager came storming up to see what the noise was, but before he got to me, one of the staff who'd witnessed the exchange let him know that Stacy had threatened to counsel me if I didn't carry the frames all at once. But sadly, Stacy never got into much trouble either, at least as far as I know. She may have received a stern talking to in the store manager's office, but she was still just as much of a bully after this incident. Not that this was surprising, and all the time I worked for that company, I don't think I ever saw a manager get held accountable for their crappy behavior. The store manager told the closed section staff to go back to our normal areas, and that was pretty much the last we heard of it. I think I'm actually impressed that 8 items and possibly even more stuff that was on those shelves got irreplaceably damaged and it seems like next to nobody got any blame or any amount of a hard time over it. There was no ramification at all. I guess it just shows you how much every level of that store management cared. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now, if you want to hear another malicious compliance story that was way crazier than any of the ones in this video, click on that left video. Or if you missed my latest video, click on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories. <laughs>